Hey, welcome to the broadcast. My name is Jeremy Fine. I'm the pastor here at Accelerate Church, and this is my wife. Hi, I'm Erin, and we are so excited here at Accelerate Church that you have joined and tuned in today. And we invite you to come sometime. Just come visit us. We'd love to have you and see you. And I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit has a word just for you today. You may be going through all kinds of things in life, but if you will tune in to His voice and His word, He has your answer. That's right. If you can't join us in person at 10 a.m. on Sundays at 4400 South Crockett, then you ought to go to our website, AccelerateChurch.cc. We have all our sermons there, and you can watch our services live and be a part of what God is doing here at Accelerate Church. But right now, we're going to get into the word today. Let me just say this. You're not made to just stumble through life and it just be average. You're supposed to make it count. When I think of the Christmas story, I think about all that God went to, all the prophecies hundreds of years before Jesus was here. And really, if you study the Bible, it says before the foundations of the earth were founded, it was purpose that the Son of God would come. And so I think about that. I think about the prophecies. I think about angel visitations to Mary, to Joseph. Well, I mean, even to Elizabeth, Mary's cousin. Even two shepherds that were watching sheep, minding their own business, angels appeared. I think about wise men from the east came from miles away. It took them almost two years to find Jesus following that star. And I just think of things like this. Sometimes I stop and meditate, and it is amazing to me the links that God went to to make it count when he sent his son. And, and thinking along that line is what's kind of led me into this series. And no, I'm not going to take verse by verse and look at the Christmas story, though you ought to do that. And you ought to read it, even on Christmas Day. And thank God that the Son of God came to take your place. He was born to die and to take your place. And I, I think about that. And you ought to study the life of Jesus and you can see how he made it count. We looked at that a little bit last week out of the book of John, how he said, I have food you don't know about. Yeah, he was making it count. If you're going to make it count, you, you tick a little bit different than the average person. And uh, the point of all this is if the Lord went to great lengths to make it count when Jesus stepped out of eternity and into our time. And we look at that example of how Jesus didn't waste any of his time. I mean, look, he went to heaven as a 33-year-old man. That's younger than me. I'm still a young spring chicken myself. But I think, wow, he was only 33. You got to think of all that we read about the life of Jesus. This was a young man. And so he made his life count. He didn't even start his ministry till age 30. He packed so much in three, just over three years. It's quite amazing when you read the scriptures. And, and the book of John tells you that if all the books in the world were to tell about, it, none of them could contain everything that Jesus did. He made it count. Here's my question. Are you following that example and making your life count? The reason he made it count is so that your life could mean something. And in the book of Ephesians, I'd like you to say, thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. We see that not only did Jesus make it count, but we're challenged as New Testament believers to make our life count. It says in Ephesians 5 and verse 14, awake you that sleep. That's always a good thing to preach on Sunday morning. In a New Testament church. Why? Because some of you hadn't had peace all week. You come in here, you have so much peace. You... And of course, some of you didn't sleep good last night. So, you know, this is the only time you're going to be able to sleep maybe. Well, I don't want me to wake you up. But then again, the Lord said, awake. You that are asleep, arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. See then. See that we're children of light. That you walk circumspectly. Yes, I said it that way on purpose. I want you to understand, he wants you to walk exactly the way he's called you to walk. He wants you to live exactly the way he says in his word to live. Not as a fool. A fool never thinks of eternity. A fool only sees here and now. You see, there's a lot of people in this world that if they knew you were at church on Sunday morning, they would think you're a fool. But the world doesn't determine who the fools are. God determines who's foolish. God determines who's wise. God determines what's right. God determines what's wrong. You're supposed to walk exactly right. Not as a fool, but as a wise person. Redeeming the time, Ephesians 5, 16 says. Because the days are evil. So in this, there's an urgency that is kind of the heartbeat of this entire series. We've got to make this life count. 
We got to redeem the time. Can't be wasting time. Last week, I pointed out three points, three things we can do to make life count. One, keep an internal perspective. Two, make the word your standard. Mark talked about that on Wednesday night. Three, never give up or quit. Today, I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to talk to you about point number one, keeping an eternal perspective. And I will tell you that up front, when you hear this, it sounds like duty, but this one tweak in your life of looking at life from an eternal perspective could have the most impactful uh, thing that you ever do. So let me back up and say that this could be the most impactful thing you ever do is to take an eternal perspective instead of looking at the way things look in the natural. This might be the most impactful thing you do, I promise you. So, so don't sit here and be like, oh, okay, you think of eternity. Okay, great. No, this literally changed my life as a preacher's kid, raised in church, grown as an adult, served in two other churches as an adult, married the woman of my dreams, praise God, and in church, but realizing I'm not really making my life count. What woke me up? Well, Hearing a radio drama about eternity woke me up. It gave me a different perspective. And I thought, what am I doing with my life? I'm so caught up in things that don't really matter. I'm not really making my life count. And I'm challenging you this Christmas season to make a change. To do what I did back in 2006 and say, I'm done playing games. Maybe no one can tell you're playing games. Maybe you're at church every time like I was. But I know this, my heart is engaged now in following the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I'm going to make this life count. And I know this, I wouldn't be speaking to you today if I hadn't made that decision. In my hallway, all by myself there. I wasn't all by myself, the Lord was with me, the, my wife was with me. But not, I made that decision, I'm going to make this count, I'm going to do what God called me to do, and it's impacted you. You don't know who all you'll impact when you decide to make it count. Psalms 90 verse 2 says, before the mountains were brought forth or ever, you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting, that's back there, to everlasting, that's in the future, you are God. (laughs) This is a simple verse. Psalm 90 verse 2, I thought, well, should I even share this? Most people understand that from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. But I want you to really meditate on that statement for just a moment. And I want to tell you, it's going to be near impossible to wrap your little mind around that statement. That from everlasting in the past, eternity in the past, there's no beginning point. God was there. Into the future where there is no end point, God is there. Woo! Just talking like that inside of me creates an awe. Whereas if I live like the average American, I'm just like, well, it's just church. It's just God. No, 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 no. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Glory to God. He is king. And he reigns and he's alive today. And he's not sad. He's not depressed. Oh, no. He, he's alive and he reigns in victory. And those that follow him reign in victory. He's always been God. He'll always be God. Then he created you an eternal being. Isn't that something? Angels look in to the creation of man and say, what is it about man that you're mindful of him? That the king of kings would come and become a man. See, God is a spirit. We have a hard time understanding that, but we're a three-part being. You're a spirit. You have a mind, will, and emotion that you're in charge of. And you live in a body that very much mimics what the spirit looks like. But we get caught up in just seeing with our natural senses, and God gave us those senses for a reason. But you're not ever going to make your life count if you're stuck to the sense realm all your life. You're going to have to feed your spirit. You see, in the day of adversity, it's the strong spirit of a man that will sustain him. If your spirit's not strong, you won't be sustained in adversity. You may not know this. You may not feel this. But I'm here to tell you, adversity is here for the Christian. The Bible says, the Holy Spirit emphasized it. 
In the Greek, it's double said double, t- double time, twice, which means you better pay attention to this. Then in the last times, what's going to happen? Perilous times will come. And he's talking to the Christian. Look, the way of the transgressor is always hard. If you live opposed to the Word of God, your life's going to be hard. There's nothing anybody's going to do about it. Hey, Pastor Jeremy here from Accelerate Church. And his wife, Erin. And we want to invite you this Christmas season to Accelerate Church. If you're in need of peace, joy, love, hope, wisdom, these are all gifts Jesus gives. And come to church. It's found in His Word. That's right. Every Sunday, 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We'd love to see you soon. And we want to wish you a a Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. The Holy Spirit says expressly, that we're living in a time, it's here, that's called perilous for the Christian. Now that shouldn't depress us. The Holy Spirit's not trying to depress us. He's trying to warn us so that we're ready. See, some people take it wrong. A warning is not to put you in fear. But when the warning's from the Holy Spirit, it's a guarantee. The weatherman doesn't come on the TV and warn you if there's an impending storm that's damaging so that you just get in fear and just quake. And you're, no, they're telling you so that you take cover and hide your gear so that it doesn't get destroyed. Right? But if you just, oh, no, the, the, Big John is making me afraid. If you don't know Big John, he's one of our local weathermen. Doppler Dave's making me afraid. It's not them making you afraid if they're telling you what's happening. Fear is a personal problem. You got to write that one down. You didn't find it in the Bible to be afraid before the mountains were created. You ever seen a mountain and just been in awe? I have been. I flew into Denver just yesterday. I told my wife, I said, look out there. And I mean, on the horizon, there's just all these ridge of mountains. I said, look at that. It is a, it's a glorious thing to see. God's creation. You may not like the mountains. That may not be your gig, but I like it. And especially from the air, flying on that jet, I said, whoo, the sun was going behind a cloud. It's like beams of glory behind those mountains. I said, look at that. Wow. Hey, before any of them were created, before God even formed the earth or the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Try to wrap your mind around this. Space above us is endless. It's endless. I was going to look it up, didn't have time because of everything happening, but I will say this, it was just a few months ago, I had to run back upstairs for something, and I had, this was last year, so last year's football season, I had left a game on, and when I ran upstairs and and to grab something that my wife sent me for, I looked and 60 Minutes was on. And it caught my attention because it was the leading scientist that works with NASA talking about how our telescopes now, they can see so far out all these Light years out, they can see. He said, but we can only see 4%, 4% of what's out there. I I caught that. And I know that was of God that I heard that because I was like, that is the leading, because it said that on there, leading scientist from NASA. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This is one of the smartest guys on the planet. And he's saying that we only know 4%. So there's 96% of space we can't even see, though we have a, One Hubble telescope's out there. I've seen some of those pictures where they've taken a picture so far out that Earth looked like just a little, tiny little dot. And you're telling me we're only seeing 4% of what's out there? That's because our God is big. Wow. When I think about things like this, I, I don't know about you, but I start to get awed that he would come and make it count and die for me. How dare I give him half effort? I guess I raised my finger today. I, I, guess, I guess I felt the Holy Spirit just a tad. It ain't based on your feelings. He's worthy no matter what mood you're in. I'm in a bad mood. Straighten up, would you? Let the Holy Spirit give you self-control so you know how to control your mood. God has always been. God will always be. Praise the Lord. Then he made sure that every human has this written inside them. So I didn't come to argue with anybody today. And I learned when I witnessed to strangers, I don't argue with intellect about these side issues. I bring up eternity as fast as I can. In fact, most of you know this, but there, there was a time that we went to New Orleans 
And I told our TV crew, I said, get the cameras ready. We're going to have media badges because I found out the first year I went down there and handed out tracks of witness. A lot of people just throw them on the ground. They have to sweep them up and out. In fact, if you walk in New Orleans during Mardi Gras, all the way down St. Pete Street, you're going to see all kinds of thrown on the ground tracks. Thank God for tracks. You might want to stock up on some in this end time hour because they're effective. People have been born again by a track. I'm not downing them. But I said this, I want to witness in a different way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show up and act like we're a, a TV crew because we are. And I'm going to say, we're doing interviews. I'm going to send a couple of people to just people walking by. You want to do an interview about Mardi Gras? Sure. So they lined up to get witness to. They had no idea what was coming. <laughs> I like this. I think it was a God idea. So when I witnessed and I, here's what I said. I, I said, all right, here we go. You want to talk about Mardi Gras? Oh, yeah. What's your favorite part? The girls, the, the booze, the this, the that, the that. I said, okay. Um, did you know we're standing a block from where someone was shot last night? Oh, yeah, I know. What happens when people die? <laughs> now, they didn't know what I just did. But I went past all this. See, they think they're doing an interview. I'm trying to be wise as a serpent on this one. What happened? I, all of a sudden, I brought up something that God's written on their heart. See, not only does God exist, but he's written this on every man's heart. You say, really? Yeah, really. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, you just might want to know this. He has put eternity in their hearts. In their hearts. You see, you can try to argue, and some people do this. They get so caught up in natural living life. I'm not even talking about sin. Sin will blind you. You need to know that. So if you're in sin, you're for sure going to be blind about this. But I'm talking about you just live like the average Amarillo and lives. Where you're just a good old boy, good old girl. You just want to help people. You just have a good heart, right? You're, you're a nice person. Did you know that just by the cares of this life, you can cover up that eternity that he wrote on your heart? But when someone shows up, because maybe you weren't at Mardi Gras. I sure hope not. But I, unless you're witnessing with me. But I can tell you this. You need someone to come across your path and ask you, what happens when people die? Because I have still noticed I've never met a 130-year-old. Have you? That's a problem, isn't it? You see, it's inconvenient to think about. It is. We'll talk more about that later, Lord willing, today if I hurry up. But I have to say this, it might be inconvenient to think about, but every person breathing will die if Jesus, Terry's, is coming. Right. Now I heard myself preaching, I saw myself, I was listening, I didn't watch it necessarily, but I heard myself on television today saying not everyone's going to die, quoting the Bible. There will be those that are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Right. I hope you're in that group, because yeah. I believe that's coming soon. Yeah. But if there's something we don't see exactly right, and Jesus, Terry's, is coming, like happened with a lot of saints I knew in 1988, thought he was coming, but then they passed on since 1988. They've stepped into eternity. So you see, you only get one life. You get one shot. You can't rewind it. You can't reset it like you can in Nintendo, right? Can't repeat it. You get one shot. And it's only what you do for Christ that's going to matter. But when I talk this way, these aren't just words. Eternity is written in your heart. You may cloud that up and cover that up with all kinds of cares of life, but I just want you to know today, God has put eternity on your heart. And so when I say this, I believe, I don't know who all is going to hear me, but I know this, you should know this, you are going to live forever somewhere. And it's this life, this stewardship where we get to choose what we're going to do. Life equals stewardship. I want you to catch this. Everyone knows in their heart. There is life beyond right here and right now. Again, some people cover this truth with different cares of life, but don't lose sight today. Listen to me, church family. Don't lose sight of the eternal. You will lose sight of the eternal if you only view things from the natural. Yeah. And I want to say this. This might shock you a little bit, but I want you to think about what I'm saying. If you lose sight of the eternal, you're going to lose your God-given strength. I call it stuck in in. In? You mean neutral? No. 
I mean natural. You can put your car in neutral. You ain't going nowhere. I don't care how hard you mash that accelerator. You can mash that sucker to it's red line and you're not going anywhere until you put it in drive. You got that? Every car person, everybody that drives knows that. But what about all the Christians stuck in the end? They just look at things through the natural. You're never going to make your life count stuck on the natural. You can stay up to date with everything happening at Accelerate Church by downloading our app. Add events directly to your calendar, receive notifications when services are going live, hear previous sermons preached by Pastor Jeremy, and you can even give right there from your mobile device. The Accelerate Church app has everything you need right there in the palm of your hand. Head over to your app store today and type in Accelerate Church Amarillo to download to your mobile device. Grace isn't some kind of sloppy thing that covers your sin. Grace is empowerment over sin. See, you've got to get a different perspective. We don't look at things that are seen. We look at things that are not seen. Now look at this part, 2 Corinthians 4.18. For the things which are seen are temporary. Everybody say temporary. Temporary, temporary here means subject to change. So when you just see the way it looks, that's subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal. They're never changing. They're eternal. What? Things that aren't seen. So he's like, oh, uh, oh, you woke up my nap, Pastor, by clapping. Well, you're certainly not going to live with eternity in view if you're so caught up on the temporary. We got to look at life through eternal lenses. In fact, I'll say it like this. If you keep looking at life through the temporary lens, it's going to blur your eternal vision. Did you catch that? If you keep looking at life only through the temporary, the subject to change lens, you look at it and say, well, look, I'm looking at the temporary. It's going to blur your eternal vision. That's what's going to happen. It will change the way that we conduct ourselves, our behavior, and our lifestyles if we have eternity in mind when we do certain things. It will keep you from flipping off someone that made you mad on the highway. I don't even remember the last time that's happened in my life. They used to say, well, yeah, I know some people. Well, you're the pastor. There are pastors that do that. I'll let you know. But you know what? I, the, the thing about it is this. That ain't going to be a part of my life. Why? I don't want to stand before God. Say, I anointed you to preach, and you got ticked off at somebody that didn't know how to drive just another day in Amarillo, and you got so angry that you said in sign language what you said? Is this real talk or not, man? You say on Sunday morning, people are like, I ain't never done that. Yeah, right. Kind of like the people that I, I don't like it when the preacher talks about money. Five dollar bill blows on the parking lot. They'll go run to chase it. Run. Sprint. Listen to me. This is very, very important that you hear this. We're almost done today. But it's a faulty foundation to build your life on things that are subject to change. I want to say that again. It is a faulty foundation to build your life upon things that are subject to change. If it's subject to change and you're basing your life on that, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. We've got to make it our goal to build our lives based on the eternal instead of the natural. You got the capacity to take a few more verses today? We'll go to Hebrews 6. Let's quickly look at this. Hebrews chapter 6. I love the Word of God. How about you? You know, I, since I sat under my pastor this week, I know he sets his alarm and preaches and comes to an end so early. And I'm like, I came all this way. I want more. more. And, I, and so I told myself this morning, that's exactly how church members are, even if they just walk from across the street. They want more. Yeah. It's not even noon yet. So praise the Lord. I still got time. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And by the way, there is no scripture that says that noon thou shalt endeth. <laughs> just to let you know. Hebrews chapter 6, say, thank God for the word. Did I give you time to turn there? 
I got it on the screen too. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. What are we talking about? The very basics. And these principles never change. Principles never change. Mark said that earlier. I hope you caught it. Principles never change. Well, he said, leaving that discussion, let's go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation. Now, this tells us something, if you'll pay attention here. This verse reveals the foundation of every Christian life. Are you following me? Here's what it is. Repentance from dead works. See, you can't be a Christian until you repent. You've got to repent. You've got to turn directions. You've got to have godly sorrow where you don't go back and commit the sin again. That's repentance. Okay? It's not just feeling sorrow. And by the way, it shouldn't, you shouldn't just feel sorrow uh, at the victim you sinned against or, or with even. What you ought to do is think, wait a minute, I sinned against a holy God. See, if you're really going to get into true repentance, that's going to be the first thing you think about is, oh, I offended a holy God. I'm sorry, Lord, I do not want to offend you. But see, most people, they don't even, that, that's thinking of the eternal right off. So they're more kind of, oh, no, I heard Alex's feelings. I'm so sorry, Alex. I'm so sorry. But wait a minute. If God called you out of strife, first you hurt him before you hurt Alex or whoever it is that you get in strife with. Are you following me? So, uh, you know, you might be offended with someone, but that's misplaced. Does that make sense? All right, so these are foundational. Repentance from dead works, faith towards God. I, I want to preach on each one of these, but that's not my point here today. Another foundational doctrine, verse 2, Hebrews 6, the doctrine of baptisms. You need to be baptized. Praise God. Of laying on of hands. These are all foundational doctrines. Of the resurrection of the dead. For those that don't believe it's going to happen, it's a foundational doctrine. It needs to be in your Christian foundation. But look at this last one. This one really stuck out to me. Of eternal judgment. I got to thinking about this. There's a lot of people that claim they're Christians that have never had the thought of eternal judgment. If they truly had the thought of it, they wouldn't do what they're doing. See, you would not shack up with just anybody just because you feel like it if you think about eternal judgment. Well, that went over real big, didn't it? Write this down, eternal judgment is a foundational part of every Christian's life. Pastor Jeremy here, that's all the time we have today, so I hate to interrupt myself preaching there, but we had a good time today. Yes, we did, and we invite <laughs> you to come in person, come see us. Stop by and say, hey, Pastor Jeremy, hey, Miss Aaron, I saw you on TV because we would love to meet you Absolutely. and shake your hand. Absolutely, and be sure and tune in again next time on the same station, same time for the Accelerate Church television broadcast.